Good morning. Welcome to the health department. My name is Judy Halstead. I'm the health director here at the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department, and I want to welcome everybody. We are very proud that this year is the 20th celebration for Safe Kids in Lincoln Lancaster County, and we're very happy that many of you have been partners for most of those years. Um, we're going to recognize some of you for your special work as part of Safe Kids, but we really are recognizing everyone today for their work, and we want to thank you. Um, we will get started in about five minutes. We're going to let some folks who uh, are just getting here get in and get some lunch. Um, but I'm very, very pleased to just briefly introduce Joe Scar and Jenna Sherwood Klein, who are our partners from B107.3, uh, one of the stations with Broadcast House that most of you know is 44th and O Street. Um, they're very close to us in proximity, but they work with us all year long. I know many of you see them here today and have seen them at our annual banquets, but they work with us all year long. And we're very, very happy for that partnership. We're very uh, thankful for the fact that they help us out and do a number of different um, media spots for us throughout the year, uh, and they work very hard. I'd just like you to um, join me in welcoming Jenna Sherwood Klein and the wonderful Joe Scar. B107.3, thank you. We got a wonderful, whoa. All right, how many other Viking fans are, are in, the, in the room? One. One. How many other Packer fans? Oh, you're outnumbered. Okay, Broncos? <laughs> Chiefs? All right, whatever. <laughs> thanks, Judy. Thank you very much for having us. Um, and thanks for this great lunch. We're uh, pleased to be here, uh, and I think we did this a couple of years ago. So, And this is a big one, 20 years. So thanks for having us, B107.3. Uh, Jenna and I have done a lot of stuff with uh, the Safe Kids going way back with the car seat safety check. So we're, uh, we're happy to be here. And as Judy mentioned, the longevity and the growth of Safe Kids, pretty remarkable and a direct reflection of the incredible commitment that you people have made to the safety of our kids. So thank you very much also. And we're proud to say we've been involved with the Safe Kids partnership for over 10 years and going strong. We look forward to be, being involved for many more years to come, like maybe 20 more if you all can yeah. hang around yeah. with us. I think, I think we could definitely do it. Now, by a raise of hands, how many of you are new to Safe Kids within the last five years? That's great. It's wonderful to see some new growth and a healthy sign for plants as well as community coalitions. Okay, how many have been around and working with Safe Kids for, say, five to 15 years? Show of hands again. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, Community-driven efforts such as Safe Kids can only thrive when there is significant long-term commitment by key community stakeholders like yourself, so we thank you. So now, how many of you have been involved for 15 to 20 years? <laughs> yeah. That group gets a little bit smaller. But that is fantastic because we want to thank you for making safety for your children a priority for so long. It's now our pleasure to invite Safe Kids Lincoln Lancaster County co chairs Susan Epps and Brian Baker to come up and test our knowledge about Safe Kids. Thank you. Okay, uh, hopefully you've had enough time at your tables to get through most of the quiz uh, that, that's there. So we're going to take this opportunity to uh, have a um, kind of a history lesson with Safe Kids involving you. Uh, so you let us know uh, which answers you have at your table and we'll kind of go from there and sh she'll ask a question. I guess I'm going to start with a the question, then we'll kind of go back and forth. And uh, we have prizes for the table or tables that uh, have the most correct answers about Safe Kids Lincoln and Lancaster County. So, Susan, with that, oh, oh sorry, <coughs> my turn to go first. All right, question number one, how many choking prevention small parts testers, those um, little items on your table there, has Safe Kids distributed to doctor's offices and child care providers since 1995? Anybody care to guess? A, B, C, <laughs> as easy as one, two, three. A, oh. C, over 8,000. All right, what was the leading cause of death to Lancaster County children, birth to 14 years of age in 1995? A. A. A, that's right, unintentional injuries, and it remains the leading cause of death today. How much program funding has Safe Kids Lincoln Lancaster County received since 1995? 
Yes. How about B? Yes. B. There we go. How about never enough? Yeah. How many bike helmets has Safe Kids distributed since 95? B. Answer is A, over 5,000. Okay. Why has Safe Kids used over 700 dozen eggs in the past 20 years? D. D. How about D, B, and C? Yes, we do feed our volunteers that come and help us at our car seat checks, but we don't feed them eggs. Um, maybe we should try that. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's, it's to demonstrate the importance of wearing bike helmets and using safety belts and car seats correctly. <laughs> And the price of eggs today, we, I think, may be looking for new, new ways to get our messages across. Question six is how many car seats were checked at the first Safe Kids car seat checkup event in Lincoln? And the answer is one. One. Eighteen years ago, our first event, one car. Okay. How many car seats were checked at the second car seat check event? Some of you probably remember this in the back there. Uh, this, was, this was at our new Walmart on 27th and oh, 27th, North 27th Street, uh, back in the day there. That was 76 car seats, so A. There's a little snowstorm going on. Jeannie, Jeannie, were you there for that? Were you there for that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, question eight. What color was Brian's hair in 95 when Safe Kids started? A. A. That's right. Look what we've done to the poor guy. <laughs> All right. Question nine. How many community organizations were involved with Safe Kids in 1995, back in the beginning? B, seven. And today, how many community organizations are currently involved? Also B, 53. How many smoke alarms were installed by more than 600 community volunteers during the six smoke alarm rallies from 2009 to 2011? A, B, B. Hatcher should know this one. Boo, the pressure was, yeah, th that's good. B, 2036. All right. Approximately how many car seats have been checked at Safe Kids car seat check events since the first event in 1996? A, 5,000. And how long does it take on average to check one car seat? B, 45 minutes. That's right, you have to find all the old french fries and melted skittles and other things that are yes all right how many person hours have been volunteered checking car seats at safe kids events b b eighteen thousand seven hundred and fifty volunteer hours that's awesome you know, I have always been so impressed with our Safe Kids Coalition because of the community collaboration and because of the support we receive from our um, city and county officials. It's um, a real gift that we have. Thank you again for all your uh, commitment to Safe Kids Lincoln Lancaster County. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Jenna and Joe. Thanks, Brian Susan. We had no idea. And thank you, by the way, for your leadership skills with the Safe Kids over the years. Appreciate it. Um, it's now our pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Jason Kruger. Dr. Kruger is an emergency physician at CHI Health St. Elizabeth and emergency medical services director for Lincoln Fire and Rescue and several other EMS uh, agencies in southeast Nebraska. Dr. Kruger is also the father of four young children, so he can relate directly to the challenges of trying to keep kids safe. Please help us welcome Dr. Kruger. Um, first of all, just <coughs> before I get started here, 
thank you to everybody in the room for everything you do to help kids uh, stay safe in Lincoln and Lancaster County. As an ER doctor, um, it's very challenging to see um, children with these types of unintentional injuries, uh, poisonings, drowning, overdoses, and it, prevention is everything. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do. I, I really appreciate it. I wanted to talk about um, back over injuries and childhood safety. Um, a lot of these slides I got from Kids in Cars. Uh, it's an organization that, that has a lot of information, resources, and this slide is one of the scarier slides I've ever seen. It's a, a dad with, with four young children um, just sitting in your you know, car SUV, looking out your rearview mirror, turning around. Uh, there's 62 kids in this picture that you can't see. even using all your, you know, your resources with mirrors and looking. And as a driver with kids and, you know, dropping off kids in the school lines and the pickup lines and the drop off lines, this, this picture sticks with me about the kind of awareness we need as, as parents, as drivers, um, with, with how easy these kinds of injuries can happen. It's not about being a bad parent. It's not about being a bad driver. I mean, this is invisible to us. We can't see it. So we need to be aware of it when, when we're behind the wheel. So a um, little bit older slide, but in 2000, 2005 data, um, almost 50 children are being treated at hospitals every week, every week in the ER for these types of injuries. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, with regards to, to back over injuries, um, at least 50 children are backed over by vehicles every week. Um, 48 are treated in the ERs to, to die from these types of injuries every week in this country. You know, there's, there's some thought, you know, are, are kids more in more danger outside the car than inside the car? And as we track this data, a, a lot of these information, maybe the numbers are going up because we're more accurately capturing this data with regards to the ability to kind of mine this information from computers. But, you know, I, I worry if we bring these slides even up to date, them to 2014, you know, 2015, how distracted we are, and I'm guilty of it too, on our cell phones, checking messages. I mean, the first thing we do when we get back to our car after some meetings is, you know, okay, turn on your cell phone, let's go through the messages. And everything that can happen behind your car that you don't realize it, and then a couple minutes later, okay, I've got through that, turn the car on, I'm gonna back up. And there wasn't anybody behind it when I first started, I checked the rearview mirror, but just constant awareness and vigilance of what can happen and how easy it is for a little toddler to get back there and you wouldn't even see him. Uh, the age range, the most common age range is 12 months to, to 23 months. And it usually is a parent or a close relative. Um, a lot of times it's, they call it kind of the bye-bye syndrome. Mom, dad gets in their car to go to work, to go off somewhere. Maybe somebody else is watching the other kids. They don't realize the kid gets out the door is behind the car uh, and little children that age aren't really aware of you know that's a dangerous place getting behind a car uh, playing in the garage and um, the driver ends up backing over the child and these can result in severe fatal injuries um, can I click ahead here the, the two main terms here blind spots which we commonly think of when we're changing lanes kind of the behind the right of the car, behind the left of the car, where you turn around, you look in your blind spot before you change lanes, um, you can click again, versus the blind zone, which is the area behind the car, and, and there's a small area in front of the car too where you just can't see. Looking out your back mirrors, turn around looking, you can't really see exactly what's going on. Uh, and this is just something we need, awareness is the only way to, to really try to prevent these types of injuries. Go to the next slide here. And realizing um, different sized cars have different areas of blind zones. And the worst thing, I mean, is, is being a taller guy, um, you can maybe, your blind zone's not quite as high, but you know, more frequently moms, you know, a little bit shorter, that blind zone is a lot bigger. And just as new, new car designs, 
And I mean, these don't even have the little DVD players and things like that anymore that kids are, are watching. Maybe when you've got the car going and you're backing up, just how little you can see out your rear view mirror. Um, you know, I mean, new styles of cars, I mean, these, the rear windshield is just getting smaller and smaller. And fortunately, with the Range Rovers, you, you can click it. I mean, their backup mirrors and, and, and front mirrors are becoming more prevalent in newer cars, but still most cars don't have these. Um, to, to try to eliminate these blind zones and try to prevent these types of just, just horrible, horrible injuries. Um, you know, people don't think about this. I mean, this isn't really, when you're buying a new car um, and you're going about your day-to-day -day life, this isn't something that most people spend a lot of time discussing with their kids, discussing with their families, how, you know, it's dangerous to, to run behind mommy and daddy's car when mommy and daddy gets in the car to go do not go in the garage. Stay inside with you know grandma or you know mommy, daddy, brothers, sisters. Don't don't run out the door and get behind the car um, because we can't see you. Um, auto manufacturers. I mean, we, we don't advertise. This doesn't get a lot of publicity. I mean, this this kills people in our country every year. It doesn't get a lot of publicity, um, but these are all these are all tragedies. A lot of, I mean, until recently, it's very hard to try to track this data. I mean, a lot of it, you know, car versus pedestrian injuries to really track how many of these happen. But we know it happens, and as we capture this data, um, we're, we're recognizing this more as, as a significant uh, thing that we need to be aware of. Um, and again, the, the, a lot of these are just kind of hidden in data, with, you know, ICD-9, now ICD-10 codes, how many of these you can actually track so we really know the extent of the problem. Um, front overs, I mean, in addition to back overs, front over injuries happen as well. We, we can kind of click through the, just kind of bring up all the little points. But um, again, data indicates more than one child is, is being killed every week from these. Um, fatalities seem to be increasing. And I, I bet in 2015, it's just as bad. I and mean, we have cameras, but we are so distracted with our cell phones. We're all guilty, a lot of us are guilty of that. Um, and just being aware of, uh, how frequent, how many, how many deaths and injuries are caused by this? And all vehicles have these blind zones. Um, the cameras can help, but it's still cameras aren't perfect either. Um, these types of inju fatal injuries are on the rise. A lot of this may be just better tracking with, with data, but there's too many people dying from this every year in our country. Um, there, there's, if your car doesn't have these um, backup technology, there is some aftermarket technology available that you, that you can get on your cars, um, but, but technology doesn't replace awareness. And this is something that we just don't think about when we're driving around our car and, and throwing it in reverse at your home, in your driveway, and these school drop-off and pickup lines is a dangerous thing because you don't know who's behind you. This is just some of the pictures. This Kids and Cars website has just an outstanding amount of data and resources, and each one of these kids has a story. And you can read through a couple of them, and then you kind of have to stop, because it's pretty awful as parents write their testimonials on these. So before you turn on the key, um, really make sure that you can see what's going on behind you, because this is, uh, these, these are awful when they happen. So when Brian Baker asked me about six months ago to, to talk about maybe a topic for this, for this meeting, first said, you know, you got the wrong guy. I, I'm an ER doctor. I don't really know anything about preventative injuries. I kind of see people and meet people when preventative injuries don't work. Um, prevention doesn't work, but maybe you need to find somebody else to do this. So then I started thinking about, well, is there any case I can talk about where you know prevention was important and as, as a doctor as a nurse i mean you've got cases that are just burned into your brain that you'll never forget so june 6th 2012 um i met this family and uh, it was a kind of a normal quiet night in the er i mean not quiet i mean it was a busy night but nothing too dramatic and about 6 20 in the evening <clears throat> little Caleb came running into our waiting room saying, please help my sister, please help my sister. 
And shortly after that, mom came carrying little Aubrey, um, who she had just backed over with her car. And when they got back to our, our trauma room, I was sitting in my office and I started hearing this just screaming that I had never heard before. Working in an ER for you know, 10 years, never heard what, what was happening out there. Thought somebody was getting assaulted. I got up, ran out, and there's a flood of people running into our, into our trauma bay. And I ran in there too. Go to the next slide. Aubrey, uh, little blonde haired, blue eyed kid, looks shockingly like a lot of my kids, little blonde haired, blue eyed kids, um, had been backed over. She had a, a large portion of her left scalp missing. Her left ear was kind of dangling. She was blue around the lips, pale, cyanotic, weakly crying. And I had some outstanding nurses who did absolutely everything for me and for her and the family and figuring out, you know, what happened. We need to get, you know, we need to get IV access. We need to get a breathing tube in this kid. We need to get a pressure dressing on this. And I want to thank our nurses just and respiratory therapists, anesthesiologists, everybody who helped that night because um, it, it takes a team. Go to the next slide here. It looks a lot, a lot like our, our kids. Um, and that slide a couple before with all those kids on it, one of those looks like our kid, our grandkid, our niece, our nephew. And it's kind of something you think about in the back of your brain when you're, when you're seeing people that, God, this could be me. This could have been me. Let me go one more slide. And until very recently, the last time I saw little Aubrey, this is what she looked like. With a breathing tube, bandages, IVs. And Jamie, do you want to come up and talk now? Hi. Um, yeah, seeing this again is kind of emotional for me. Um, but bringing this awareness um, is really important to me personally. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that I'm able to share this um, story um, with you all. Um, I'm just going to give it to you how I saw it happen as it unfolded that day. Um, it was a Wednesday evening and my son Caleb had a, um, a baseball game. I think it was a game <laughs> um, that night and um, we weren't in a hurry. We weren't rushed or anything for the game. Um, Aubrey was about 21 months old at the time and we walked out to go get in the car. Um, I, I walk out and you know, she had just, you know, hadn't been walking for very, you know, too long. So I set her down and she usually walks around to the side of the car where she gets in. I open the door and she climbs in. And so that was, uh, that's what we did. We, you know, we took her out. We walked around to her side of the car. And as soon as we get to her side of the car, Caleb screams, Mom, I forgot my water bottle. I'm like, oh my God, Caleb, you know. So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm just going to run in, grab this dang water bottle, and get back to the car, and we're going to leave. So that's, what's, that's what my mind turned to was, damn it, Caleb, the damn, you know, you forgot your water bottle. <laughs> Seriously, that's where my head was. So I just turned around quickly went, ran back inside to get Caleb's water bottle and with that my mind preoccupied I came back got into the driver's side of the car handed Caleb the water bottle and proceeded to back out of the driveway um, it hadn't even registered with me that I hadn't yet even put Aubrey in the car um, and like I said I, I wasn't in a hurry I I hate to say this now because it sounds <coughs> terrible, but um, I slowly pulled out of the driveway. I didn't just rush out of the driveway. And as I'm slowly backing out of the driveway, um, I, I feel resistance behind like my back tires. 
and and I'm not registering like what the heck what what would this be we don't have a lot of toys outside I mean she's got maybe a tricycle or a um, one of those cozy coop cars or something um, so it, nothing's registering I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here and as I'm slowly backing out um, I'm not hearing any sound but as I'm pulling out of the driveway I notice going down my driveway there's like this mulberry colored stripe in front of me just going down the driveway as I'm backing out and I, I'm, I, so I'm feeling this resistance. I'm seeing this mulberry colored stripe going down my driveway and I am just like, I have no idea. I, I mean, nothing, it's not making any sense to me. So I don't know why, but I, I just continue to just kind of slowly back out and it was just like kind of an, a dissociative process where what was happening didn't seem real, like it didn't equate what I was seeing and what I was feeling and what I was doing. And then um, finally I, at the bottom of the driveway, I felt myself back over something. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, damn it, what did I back over? You know, because I'm still having this little frustration inside of me because of the water bottle. So I said to Caleb, I said, Caleb, honey, will you please just, will you get out and see what I ran over? Thinking it has to be the tricycle or it has to be something like that. And Caleb gets out and he walks over. And the next thing I hear from Caleb, he's like, Mom, you ran over Aubrey. You ran over Aubrey. And I'm like, I get out of my car and I run over and I see her and I see my child, I see her laying at the bottom of my driveway. And I, um, you know, I see her lips getting a little cyanotic and I see the hemorrhaging and I see, you know, her eyes, you know, rolling in her head and instinct decision. Um, I'm a critical care nurse myself and so, you know, we just, we act impulsively um, in crisis situations. It's just instinctive. And I just grabbed her up. Um, I just picked her up off that driveway. And I told Caleb, I said, get in the car now. And I just held her on my lap and I beelined for St. Elizabeth Hospital, which is not even really a mile apart or mile away from my home. Um, I mean, I never thought to call paramedics or, you know, I didn't think about C-spine or, you know, I wasn't thinking anything like that. I was thinking my child is going into hypovolemic shock and I need to get her butt to the hospital. And so I don't even remember, I don't remember driving to the hospital. <coughs> Caleb later tells me that, um, like, mom, do you remember when you were swerving around this? And I, no, I don't remember how I got there. Um, I do remember well, another vivid memory is uh, as we were pulling into the ER, how she vomited, um, and you know I'm trying to you know move her over to her side so she doesn't aspirate on on the vomit and she's bleeding and you know I'm just like oh my God stay with me baby stay with me baby and um, I I don't even think I parked the car I just think I just drove up put it in park ran inside and I remember running with my little girl who's just bleeding everywhere and um, I'm, I'm screaming, I'm screaming, help me, help me, help me. And I'm running and Caleb, you know, I've kind of lost where Caleb is at this time. I really don't, I mean, I know he's there, but I don't know where he's, you know, where he's at. Um, but all I just remember is I remember running, screaming with blood dropping all over the place. And then I remember the doors of the ER at the time, I just remember the doors were open and like everybody just came running towards me and they grabbed my little girl out of my hands and they took her. And it was like a swarm of people just like dove in on her. And I, I sat there and um, I watched as you all um, 
you innovated her and you um, started her on fluids and all the things that you do, you know, for a trauma victim. And, and I remember sitting there and I, <coughs> I was screaming. I remember screaming to myself that I ran over my baby, I ran over my baby, I ran over my baby. And um, there was one <laughs> nice nurse, and I, I don't remember her name, but she sat with me and she, um, she put her arms around me and, you know, she tried to comfort me. And as a nurse, that was one of the best things that she could do for a parent is, you know, to take care of the parent and the family as well. And whoever took Caleb and, and kept him occupied and took care of him during, you know, the immediate emergency care that Aubrey received, I have so much gratitude for. Um, A lot of stuff after that I, I don't remember. I don't remember a lot from the point that she vomited, that I stopped, that we ran inside and y'all took her from me. I don't remember a lot. I remember, I, I know that they transferred her to Brian West and then she was flown to the med center in Omaha. Um, the, these pictures here are, um, they were taken the day after the accident or the next morning and that's at the med center. Um, and then this slide is um, probably, God, I want to say about six days after we got there and we were finally able to um, extubate her. Um, and I was, it was the first time I was able to hold her again. I was able to hold her. I mean, you can, it's not very easy to climb into a bed in the intensive care unit you know, with your child, but so this was like this was like the best moment for me after the accident, just to be able to hold her in my in my arms. And um, we'll go to the next slide. I can't remember. Okay, so here. This is her after she's woken up. This is probably a couple days or so after that previous slide in the ICU where she'd been extubated. Um, sedation, they weaned the sedation off so she was no longer in her um, medically induced coma. And she woke up. And that's what she, she was looking like. Um, the first day we got there, she was completely swollen. I mean, I did not even recognize my child. She was so incredibly swollen. Her, I mean, I could barely see her eyes. She was so swollen. Um, she had abrasions through her whole neck, across her chest, her arms. Um, I, I didn't recognize her at all. and. Um, The next slide. <laughs> this is one, well, the next slides come first, but here she is sitting on um, Papa Jim's lap um, when we moved her to the um, pediatric unit. Um, it took her, it took her a couple weeks to even start speaking again. She wouldn't say any words. But she started, she started becoming Aubrey again after a little bit. Um, <laughs> that's her first smile. <laughs> that's her first smile since the accident. And um, there she's working with uh, um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, like Dr. Kruger said, she had um, lost all the scalp to the left side of her head. And so she had, this is a wound vac attached to her scalp there. Um, she had surgery um, whereby the um, plastic surgeon cleaned off that wound um, and tried to do a skin graft to put on top of it so that um, to begin um, tissue growth again on top of that area. 
Um, so that's, that's what that picture is about. Um, so then, <laughs> you don't look at the mess, but here's um, Aubrey. This is our first day home after Madonna. After <coughs> Madonna, we spent, we were in the hospital, I think, at a total of six weeks. And then that's our first day home. That's our dog, Simon. His eyes are a little red. Um, but she has taken all the wet wipes out, and she is giving Simon a bath. Um, but that's our, that's our first day home. Um, after that accident and um, and that's a year that's a year after the accident we kept her head I mean she has those hats in like every color under the sun and I have every little color of um, flower bow thing that I could put in all of these hats because we had a lot of plastic surgery well she's had probably maybe 18 surgeries now um, whereby the surgeon has cut and stretched and pulled and twisted her scalp and moved it all over her head in order to eventually um, give her a full head of scalp bearing hair. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're well on our way. So anyway, so she's had that for a while. Um, the one thing with Aubrey, she, had the, I actually backed over her head itself not her midsection but her head she had three skull fractures um, one that affected her um, inner ear canal but did not affect her hearing she had one small cerebellar stroke with no, no deficit, nothing to write home about. Other than that, Aubrey's brain was untouched. There's not a single cognitive deficit that that child has as a result of that accident. Nothing. As you can tell, she is fine. <laughs> In talking about the commonality, or not commonality, but the um, incidence of these things happening, a week, exactly one week, after Aubrey's accident, a little boy in Fremont was run over by his father. His father was driving a pickup truck and the boy was in front of him and the dad didn't see him and he drove forward over the child. About, he was, I think he was two years old. That little boy died. And that was a week after Aubrey's accident. And I remember how that tore me up, you know. How could he, how could he die and Aubrey live? Um, that bothered me, and, th and that still bothers me. And, and I don't know, I, I, I see things like this, you know, I hear thing, accidents like this happening, you know, at various times throughout the, our country, and a lot of people want to blame you know, the parent, you, you weren't paying attention. If you'd only done this, if you'd only, you know, whatever, it's your fault. I've, I heard that a lot from like commenters on articles in the newspaper. Um, and it, you'll always, well, I, you know, I always will feel some sort of guilt inside me for the accident, but I know it's an accident. I, I, I know and I understand that it was an accident. And I, I am absolutely just so grateful that my little girl is alive and well today. And I don't know, I just, after talking with uh, Dr. Kruger, about the accident and then being able to share her recovery with those of you who took care of her that night. Um, that brings healing to me also. And um, I know without you guys, the team, not just you of course, but the team of nurses, I didn't mean that enough. It's all them. 
<laughs> that didn't come out right. You, you hit the nail on the head. But it, it takes the team of the physician, all the nurses, the respiratory therapists, and all that ancillary departments that work together and saved my daughter's life. And I know had I, had I just waited around and called 911, she would have bled to death. There's no doubt about that. So I am grateful. And I like to use this, um, this experience of mine to bring awareness to others. And um, that an accident like this can be prevented in the future just by being aware. And I, we, all, we all get hurried a lot of the time. You know, we're, we're always in a rush to be somewhere to meet deadlines and stuff like that. And we don't always take time to observe our surroundings before we head off to do stuff. Um, I don't know where else I was going to go. Lost my train of thought again. But anyway, um, I guess with that, I'll just say thank you. Thank you for letting us share um, our story. And I hope this brings benefit to everyone. And thank you to you guys for all your. They always put me after the sad stories, but this has such a great ending, you have to agree. Wow, thank you for sharing. And thank you, Dr. Kruger, and all of your staff as well. It means a lot to all of us, and uh, reminding us of how sobering the reality of childhood injuries is, and the impact they have on our community, and the medical professionals as family, and the families that care for them. As we know, keeping kids safe in and around water can also be a challenge. Guy Pickleman with Lincoln Fire and Rescue, he's a fire captain, is here with us today to share his experience with res resuscitating a drowning victim and give his insight as a first responder on the importance of working together as a community to do all we can to prevent this potentially tragic injuries. Thank you for having me. My name is Guy Pinkman, not Pinkelman. Those guys oh, will always sorry. remember it. That's all right. No, so, no, that's perfectly fine. Hey, uh, these things are tragic, and we're here to try and prevent them, and we really appreciate everybody that's here trying to prevent these things. Unfortunately, some things happen. They happen all the time, and, and frankly, that's kind of why we have jobs as firefighters, paramedics, as, as ER doctors and, and ER nurses. We take care of people. Uh, what you do is just as important being out in the community, talking to these folks prior. Um, we try and prevent these things from happening, not just the water issue, not just the backing over issues, but, but so many more things. Like I know Jeff works extensively with uh, the uh, um, smoke detector programs. Why? Because we don't want to have to go to a fire and pull somebody out of a fire. We hope they get out on their own. They really do. Well, unfortunately and fortunately, uh, the young lady that I got to deal with is not here today. Um, she is alive. But her, her parents, and uh, uh, this isn't something they want to dwell on. And I don't blame them, to be honest with you. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was at a pool party, a uh, birthday party that my wife, by the way, made me go to. Um, I did not want to be there. <laughs> Who wants to be at a small pool inside with 28 children screaming their heads off that are between 8 and 12 years old? Anyone? No. Exactly. But I was forced to go. And as I was there... As I was there, I was sitting, I, I got there, and my wife said, and you're staying. So she knew that, yeah, yeah oh, I just take up. No, and you're staying. So get there, walk in, sit down next to the pool, talking with some other, uh, some other families that are there, and just chatting about what I do. They were asking me a few questions. And I was on my phone texting my wife, distracted, as you were saying, texting my wife saying, you owe me so big for being here. <laughs> I already have a headache. No kidding. Took a picture of the pool with all these kids in the pool. And... Uh, and as I'm sitting there, uh, then somebody screams. Because this young lady had got in the pool. I uh, don't know the circumstances of how, but she was on the bottom of the pool. So I threw my phone. I, can't, I don't know how it landed where it did, but it landed really nice, nice area. But get over, get this young lady who is uh, not breathing at all, uh, no pulse, and had been under the water for quite some time. Um, 
opened her airway, gave her a breath, and the reason I was doing that to see how actually full she was, to see how, how, how down she was. And unfortunately, she was full. Uh, started CPR on her, doing some things. And, and, and the thing about what we do as, as responders on scenes changes when we don't have what we normally have. Uh, unfortunately, fortunately, I'm a bad penny. Some of the guys will tell you if anything bad's going to happen, I'm probably somewhere around that I'm going to have to deal with something. And uh, so I'm used to taking care of the whole scene, not just one part of it. So you understand I have 20 some children standing around me looking at me as I'm doing CPR. And I'm cognizant of that. And I want these kids out of there. Uh, because as being a firefighter, paramedic, you're a protector. You really are. And I'm trying to protect these other kids as well. So I wanted them out of there. I ended up yelling at one of the uh, older ladies that was there to make sure she got all the children out of there because I didn't want them to see it. Um, this is after, by the way, I had a little girl asking me a question as I was doing CPR. So, um, but doing CPR on this young lady, the other thing I hear is I hear the, the questions that the dispatcher is actually asking because somebody had called 911, which I asked them to do. And I could hear, well, I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. And I finally was so frustrated with that. I had what going on, what I was doing here. I'm, I could only do so much there. I'm like, give me the phone. As I'm doing CPR, because it's a little person, sorry. And I'm doing CPR, and I'm on the phone saying, who is this? And they went, well, it's Jody. Great, Jody, this is Guy. I need the guys here now, right now, no airway, get them here. I'm doing stuff. Great. Click, boom, hung up because I didn't want to hear that in the background. So good thing, after maybe a minute, two minutes of doing CPR, I got some coughing going on. I'm happy, very happy. Continue doing some stuff, more coughing, more coughing. Now spewing water, turn her to the side, covering her up, getting her a little bit further away, and all of the, the firefighters show up, which is really kind of interesting because everybody that showed up, I had actually trained. <laughs> So the first thing, you know, usually when we walk into a scene, these guys will tell you, you walk into a scene and, and if it's a bystander or whatever, we're, we'll take over. And, uh, and these guys recognized me, obviously, they actually knew that I was on scene because uh, Jody told them, hey guys, they're doing stuff. <laughs> and they walked in and they said, guy, what do you need? So said, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want, looked at the one medic, said, can you get the IV or give me the stuff? I don't care, you know, it's, it's time to move on. The other thing I was very happy about was the parents weren't there. You might think, well, you need to take care of your own kids. Yeah, we do. But those are images you can't get out of your head forever. I was actually happy they weren't there to see their child. I was happy that the next time they saw their kid, their child was going to be alive. I was happy about that. And that would have been something else I would have had to deal with at the same time. So I was kind of happy about that. So we moved the child, got her in the ambulance. Things are going well. That's when the parents showed up. That's a better scene. Came back in, started talking to the other kids. Why am I talking to the other kids? Once again, going on that protector thing, seeing what's going on. The family members are like, hey, should we cancel the party? I'm like, no way. We cancel this party right now. Everybody's perception of what just happened is going to be completely different than if we continue. So we continued with that party. Now my son is at that party. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, what did he see? <laughs> what questions is he gonna have? And my son is, oh, he's like me, he's crazy. So we're gonna have some interesting conversations. So we get done with this party. By the way, I texted my wife, said thank you for making me be here, I was supposed to be. So I apologize for that, she understood. Um, so. Now this young lady is on the way to the hospital. Great, she's alive, we're happy. Two days, I think she spent three days in the, in the uh, hospital and she was out, she has no deficits. It's an awesome thing. We had people there that, could, that recognized what was going on. There are a lot of things going on. Our focus gets pulled away sometimes, as, as for me as well. So what we do with kids, safe kids, um, and trying to prevent these injuries is so paramount to get this out so that people understand that we, we don't want to have to go on these calls. We don't want to have to respond. I mean, we're going to be there. We're going to do what we need to do when we need to do it. But if we can prevent it, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm sure you are as well. 
By the way, the question my son had for me on the way home was, Dad, why were you kissing that little girl? <laughs> Honest. So, all right. I said, I, I wasn't kissing the little girl. I had to do a few other things for her. Cool. He's uh, nine. Nine. So, yep. And that was the last question he had. So that was no more questions on that. But yeah, okay. So, uh, but once again, thank you for having me. Thank you for what you do. It's important no matter if you think it is or not, we know it is. In whatever facet you do it in. Thank you guys for uh, getting the word out for people over the radio. Appreciate that. Sorry that you have to be in front of the camera. Do it anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, with that, thank you again. Wow, as a parent, these stories are scaring the tar out of me. But that's why we're here. I mean, really, we're all doing, you guys are all doing good things to help keep kids safe. So, Guy, thank you for your efforts in uh, reviving that child and encouraging us to continue the work together to reduce all types of serious injury to kids in our community. And uh, we all know that that's what we're trying to do. Uh, it's now our pleasure to honor some of the great work in our community to ensure kids are safe each and every day. We're going to introduce the award presenters, and then they will recognize the Everyday Hero honor, uh, Award honorees. First up is Rick Campos, Fire Investigator with the City of Lincoln Bureau of Fire Prevention and Chair of Safe Kids Fire and Burn Prevention Task Force. Hey, thank you. Great story, Captain Pinkelman. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll be leaving early, too. So, All right. Captain Jeff Hatcher. I want to introduce you to him. He understands the value and importance of public education and how it enhances fire prevention. He's been coordinator. He's coordinated and conducted many uh, fire safety programs in the community and schools for many years. As a matter of fact, Jeff will be coming up on 30 years and uh, for the fire service. He, uh, <laughs> he definitely has found the, the fountain of youth, I think. <laughs> During those years of uh, chair of um, the fire safe or fire kids um, or safe kids fire prevention um, task force, He's done a few things. So one of the things is he's led a smoke alarm rallies and uh, over the last four years, in four years, they installed 2,056 smoke detectors in and around Lincoln High. That's question 11, answer B on your <laughs> quiz. We already got that. He has, uh, he's been involved in recruiting, training, and coordinating hundreds of community volunteers to help install smoke detectors. He's worked with the Fire Administration and the Lincoln uh, City Grant Writer to secure um, lots and lots of smoke detectors um, and a large amounts of money. A uh, matter of fact, the last grant that they um, had secured, the Grant Writer would not even submit without Jeff being part of it. He uh, is a known force in uh, the FEMA grant process. So a lot of those smoke detectors aren't just ones that um, are for ordinary people. You and I, he specializes and, and sees the needs of the hard of hearing and deaf and has included smoke alarms that will help them as well escape the fire. In 2012, Jeff encouraged safe kids to broaden their, um, their view and include uh, landlords and he created um, a landlord fire safe program patterned after um, a, 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 a conference he went to, brought that back and since then, um, they've had uh, 11 workshops with landlords. They've had um, 136 landlords attend and have touched um, 12,000 individual multi-housing units. So um, a, a great job there. And we think that um, it's fitting to present Jeff with the Safe Kids Everyday Heroes Award down here. Thanks, Jeff, for your commitment and your understanding of fire prevention in our community, and congratulations on being Safe Kids Everyday Hero. Well, I, uh, 
I wish every I wish every community could have this. Every community doesn't have this. Um, Safe Kids wouldn't be what it is today without Brian Baker and Susan Epps. And I just want to recognize them for all their work and what they've done for. Um, I wish every fire department could have what our, our fire department has and the collab collaboration that we have and the community members that come together because of the work of Safe Kids. And I want to recognize just a couple people that um, have made the Fire and Burn Prevention Task Force what it is today. And uh, Lynn Fisher, could you stand up for me? Lynn Fisher is a, a shining example of what a community member, what every community would love to have. Um, represent them and he is a strong player in our community and uh, he's a landlord he, he's a great great place property is that right but he's involved in the the burning task force and without him i wouldn't you know we wouldn't have done had half the efforts that we have um maggie marsh could you stand up maggie Ma maggie marsh um had a young had a, when her her little girl was a baby had a fire in her apartment and she was a spokesperson early on for us and, and put a personal touch to our efforts and we thank, thank you for your efforts, Maggie. And who else am I thinking of? Terry Spohr from Southeast Community College who isn't, who isn't here. Julie Anderson is a big player for us and a, and a big help. John Carlson who's in the mayor's office isn't here. But all these people come together thanks to, to Safe Kids and, and make, make this effort what it is. And, I've been to Safe Kids meetings in other communities, and I'm telling you, we, we've got it going here. We really do. And I, I thank you for letting us and the fire department be a part of, of the effort. So thank you for this award. It's great to be here. All right, let's see who else's name I can goof up today. <laughs> Melissa Kinsey. Did I get that right? Aquatics Director with the YMCA of Lincoln and Chair of the Safe Kids Water Safety Task Force is up next. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Kinsey and I'm with the Y and I am the Water Safety Task Force Chair and have been since we started the task force. Um, and Herb was one of our original members as well. He's with the Game Parks Commission and there's really no words for this man. He, I know, it's good and bad, <laughs> keep it all good, no. Uh, he has been an integral part of our, of our task force from day one. He is an expert on boat safety. He gets, um, gets the public. He is, connects with every boater that goes. We spent a lot of uh, <coughs> Memorial Day weekends together with handing out t-shirts, rewarding families for having their life jackets on their boats. He likes to tell jokes. He connects with the kids. He scares the adults a little bit. It's kind of fun to watch. But he, <laughs> you like it too, because you can wear a gun. OK, but <laughs> overall, he, any time that I ask him to do something, he says, where do I need to be? What do I need to bring? And how can I help? And I appreciate that so much. He very much understands what it takes as a part of the community, understands that life jackets save people's lives and he wants to share that information with everyone and I can't thank him enough for everything that he has done for the water safety task force hope he never leaves us so that we can always have him he helped recruit also the um, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary which that group of people um, puts in a lot of man hours as well and so he has just been a fantastic and phenomenal volunteer for us and a community partner with the Lincoln Lancaster County Safe Kids. So thank you very oh, much. Thank you. I'm gonna say something. You're gonna say something? Yeah, tell them your jokes. No, no jokes. Um, actually, you know, we can sit back and say, ah, oh, it's just all in a day's work, you know. On a bad day, that's when we have fatalities. On a good day is when we have no fatalities. So it's pretty easy to figure out. It's pretty black and white. Or is it really? Truly, it's not. And everybody in this room knows it's not. It's all about prevention. It really is. Um, we've been fortunate enough to recruit. Uh, and we work with safe kids across the state. Every single one of the chapters are, that 
uh, as a matter of fact, one of my guys or one of the guys that I work with uh, started Safe Kids of the Sand Hills out in uh, Ogallala, and he's got a phenomenal program out there. I wish I could copy what he does. That uh, we recruited uh, the Nebraska Airboat Association. They kind of like to give us a little bit of money every now and then. And what we'll do is buy life jackets, and and they're all youth size. And uh, when people don't have them on the boat, we'll give them to the kids, and they can keep them. And the uh, person responsible gets to keep something else. <laughs> and, <laughs> We exchange signatures and we go, we're going to meet at a place downtown on a specific date. <laughs> and he's got to push down real hard because there's five copies. <laughs> but uh, those are some of the stuff that we've done. And when you sit back and think about it, when's the last time you've heard it? At least on the boating side of the world, you know, the last time that we've had a person under 13, uh, which is the law, by the way. It, person's under 13 on any kind of a boat has to wear a life jacket all the time. And it's truly amazing when, when you try to think about the last time that we know about a fatality in the whole state of somebody under 13. Or people wearing life jackets on jet skis, makes no difference how old you are, when's the last time we had a fatality on one of those? It's too hard to remember. It's been that long ago. The common denominator, of course, is the life jackets. And I know every time anybody gets it, oh, he's going to talk about life jackets. I know he is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, and, and really the water safety part of Safe Kids is kind of a small portion of what everybody in this room does. But it's kind of neat to get to be able to talk about our small, our small corner, corner of the world. And, uh, but it's kind of neat, kind of neat to get a little award like this, too. You just never know. And I don't know which one of these is mine, but because <laughs> I wrote it. Uh, this one, it has your name on it. Oh, the small one. <laughs> Thank you. Up next is, Jan like I'm talking into a microphone, is Janelle Binder, Community Outreach Specialist with Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department and co-chair of the Safe Kids Child Passenger Safety Task Force. All right. Well, as a co-chair of the Safe Kids Child Passenger Safety Task Force, we are pleased to recognize a Safe Kids corporate sponsor that has been very faithful over the many years with financial support for our, our child passenger safety efforts. Through a matching donation program, AAA Nebraska and its Cornhusker Motor Club Foundation have contributed over $30,000 during the past few years. This funding, together with funds from other agencies, um, enables us to conduct 18 to 20 car seat checks a year and provide upwards of 150 car seats at no cost to low income families every year. In addition to this critical financial support, Marilyn is also a longtime member of our Child Passenger Safety Task Force and she often will volunteer to host car seat check events for us um, as well as the Child Passenger Safety Technician um, National Certification Trainings at their AAA location. It is our pleasure to present this much deserved Safe Kids Everyday Hero Award to Marilyn Murr, manager of AAA Nebraska Lincoln Office. I would just like to thank uh, Safe Kids for this great honor, and AAA is very, very privileged to work with some great people and we are totally supported uh, for all kinds of safety for children, but especially child passenger safety is a high priority for AAA. And so myself and Rose White, who is in charge of the uh, Cornhusker Motor Club Foundation, wants to thank you again for this. Uh, Rose was unable to attend today. She thought it was better going on a AAA cruise today, but <laughs> she's gone for seven days to the Caribbean. So she asked me to uh, give her thanks also for this wonderful award. And again, thank you for safe kids, and we'll keep with this relationship. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you for your time today. And uh, we want to say uh, thank you for the specific ways in which you protect kids from injury each and every day. It's uh, inspiring to hear how individuals and organizations step up and help meet those needs. So again, thank you so much for coming. What a great way to conclude this milestone Safe Kids celebration. Again, we're really pleased at B107.3 and Broadcast House to be a part of Safe Kids and look forward to many more celebrations. So thank you again. Uh, be safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much.